All right, everybody, welcome to the 10.30 talk right now. Um, we're here to hear uh, Casey West talk. He's uh, been working in internet infrastructure, web app security, design, um, and these all taught Casey to be a paranoid, UX-oriented, problem-solving internet plumber. His earliest contributions to Perl live to this day in your Mac. Casey's speaking and writing ranges from open source communities and cultures to technical architecture and automation tips and tricks. I'm pretty sure there's some enterprise, cloud, other words that you were mentioning the other day as well. Um, he wears the mantle of principal technologist focused on Pivotal's Cloud Foundry platform and lives in Pittsburgh raising three sarcastic children. Um, <laughs> so very appreciative to have him come all the way down from Pittsburgh to Hobart to um, do some talks down here. Um, please make him feel welcome. Good morning. Uh, how is everyone? Yeah, doing well? I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you making it out. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I tried to be as inflammatory as possible uh, in my talk title uh, to see who would, uh, who would make it, so I appreciate you coming out. Um, I suppose I got uh, introduced. Uh, I have a Twitter handle. I do the, a lot of the, the tweeting, um, and I'm excited for anyone else to also do the tweeting. So if you, if you tweet, um, tweet early, tweet often. Uh, I, uh, I'm really hoping for... Um, some great discussion at the end of the talk. So I'm, I'm building in some time. Uh, if anyone has questions or things they want to talk about, uh, problems you've had when it comes to um, estimating or tracking effectiveness or uh, convincing clients to keep giving you money when you've fallen horribly behind what you promised them, you know, whatever. Um, so uh, uh, please do that. Uh, there's a, a song I like uh, which has lyrics that um, it's better to feel pain than nothing at all. Uh, the opposite of love is indifference uh, by the Lumineers. And uh, so I hope that, uh, that you won't be indifferent uh, to the ideas that I present. Um, whether you're in violent agreement or disagreement, I'm excited for you to let me know uh, on the internet or in this room or over drinks tonight. Um, so let's dig into the first uh, concept. So let's uh, unpack lying or estimating. Um, how many of you uh, have to estimate as part of your job? Yeah, uh, me too. So how many of you enjoy lying? Wait, what? <laughs> well, then this talk is for you. No. Uh, so let's go through a methodological history. So there's sort of a history in software engineering of, um, of how we've lied over time. It's evolved. Uh, so um, we can walk through that. Uh, Here's the classic one, uh, waterfall, where uh, we lie sequentially. Um, you know, first you lie in your planning phase, and then you lie in uh, trying to get something done, and so on, uh, until you eventually lie in QA, and then in release, and then in managing and operating whatever it is you lied about in the first place in production. Uh, how many people would say that you are doing waterfall now? No one? That's excellent. Yeah, maybe a little bit. OK. Yeah. Uh, then there's. There's Agile, uh, that, that became popular. Um, some folks might want to kind of put XP between Waterfall and Agile, but XP is more of a programming practice and not very much of an estimating practice. Um, you know, does anyone have an idea of what, what Agile is? Yeah, exactly. Oh, you, you, I don't believe you that you think you know what Agile is. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, there's, some, there's, a, there's a method of being agile uh, that I think has been, become most popular, Scrum. Uh, how many people would say that you do something that, that resembles Scrum? I, I would expect that to be most folks at this point. Um, you know, so Scrum is where, um, where you lie at one or two week intervals uh, rather than you know, months at a time. Uh, you start with a big planning session where you spend um, somewhere between two and four hours uh, figuring out what you, uh, what you think you can get done in order to convince other people that uh, you're doing enough work to keep getting paid. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of a week or two weeks or three weeks, um, you have a retrospective where uh, you feel bad about what you didn't complete. Uh, and then you, you make others feel bad about what they didn't complete. Um, this is probably what most folks are doing, uh, water scrum fall, um, where you know, you've got sort of an upfront specification process and, and a really manual, laborious uh, uh, QA and release and, and uh, deployment process, 
Um, but somewhere in the middle there, as engineers, as programmers, you believe that you're being agile and you're doing Scrum um, because you're checking in frequently or something like that. <laughs> That's probably uh, uh, as close as it gets. Uh, does anyone feel like this resonates with them, that you're, you're, yeah, you're probably in this camp? Sure. Um, so these are all a horrible waste of time. And, and that's sort of uh, a, a big part of my thesis here. Uh, you spend um, many hours uh, a week or every couple of weeks um, trying to guess at uh, what you think you can get done with incomplete information. And uh, then you spend another hour or so again at the end um, trying to justify why you didn't get done uh, what you thought you would. Um, either by trying to point out the incomplete information or just by uh, making things up, you know, um, whatever you have to do in order to feel, feel justified. Uh, and I, I feel like that's a big waste of time, but I feel like it's sort of a given in our industry now. We, we expect that this is what we have to do. Um, so there is, uh, there is an alternative. Um, there's this concept of no estimates. Yeah, sure. So there's a concept of no estimates. Uh, the no estimate movement, I would say, started maybe about three years ago. Has anyone heard of this, this concept? So, so this concept is, um, is essentially uh, to, uh, to iterate in, uh, in tighter cycles in, and to eschew uh, estimating, don't worry about it at all. Um, you still do planning, and you pile up your work into uh, what you believe will be the, the sequential order of things, and you can reorient it or re reshuffle it just like Agile, but the idea is, or just like Scrum, I should say, but the idea is um, that you can, uh, you can shuffle your work at any time. So you can always respond to change, to new information. Um, and if you do this, then, then you're not making any guarantees about when anything will get done, um, which also means that you're not, uh, you're not making uh, hard set guarantees about um, the order in which things will get done. Um, because uh, as I said, you, know, you always begin a project with incomplete information despite everyone's best intentions. So uh, the idea of the no estimate movement is to just say, you know what, we will not lie. We will not pretend to know when we'll get it done. We will just begin and we'll go and we'll track progress over time. Uh, and I think that uh, this is better, um, but there are problems with it. So I went looking for, for I tried to put um, what I hope to be good looking photographs on my slides so you at least have something nice to look at. I can't believe this is actually a car. This, I don't know what kind of car this is because I'm not a car person, probably some Italian sports car, but it's actually fully chrome. Does anyone know what kind of car this is? Right, but it's actually completely covered in chrome. It's amazing. So, uh, gold-plated cars in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so I'm flying through there, but it's like on my way out. Three, but it's three hours in the middle of the night, so I won't be able to see any gold-plated cars. Yeah. So, so one of the issues with with the no estimates thing is that 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 probably sounds good to us as as programmers because really, what do you want to do? You want to come in. You want, to, you want to get your coffee in the morning or, or your tea, uh, sit down and, and read Reddit for an hour with nobody bothering you. Uh, then you. Then you just want to work. You just want to program, right? And then when you're finished, you want to go home and enjoy yourself. Uh, and that's fantastic. But your managers and your product managers and your line of business owners or whatever enterprise term you use for people who uh, think that they know what you're supposed to build, they're, they're terrified by this idea. Um, so they're asking you, you know, but when am I going to get my shiny new toy? But when am I going to get this? Uh, your customers are asking you, when am I going to get my shiny new toy? Uh, and you know, that's a real thing. And so one of the things that we need to think about is uh, the context that we're operating in. Uh, this is something I think uh, as programmers we often, we often miss. Um, we miss the bigger picture or we uh, willfully ignore it uh, to make ourselves happy. Uh, so I'd like to at least uh, try and, and address the, the bigger picture. Um, we are an investment. Uh, the work that we do, um, the people that are paying us to do that work, they are investing in our time and our brains and our collective creativity. Um, and so, you know, that's a really, that's a very real investment. Uh, when you're investing in, um, in stocks or something financial, uh, you want it to, to make a return, right? And 
the people who are investing in your effort and energy also want a return on that investment. And you need to give them some reason to believe that it's still worth it to continue investing. Now, this isn't just for you know, consulting or a startup-y thing. I'm not talking about you know, startups and, and VC capital. It's also in your, in your regular job. Uh, if you work on a team, how many people work, work in a team? Yeah, so that's, that's just about everyone. So if you work in a team, uh, you have at least one project that you're working on, and your business probably has you know, a dozen different projects that they want, or your organization has a, do a dozen different projects they want to get done. And they have to make decisions about which projects they're going to invest in. Now, most of the time, the way that business people do that is they say, all of them. And you say, that will cost a million dollars. And they say, we have $200,000, go to work. Uh, and so that, that's not always fantastic. But, um, but typically, trade-offs are made, right? And you have to make decisions about whether or not it makes sense to invest in one project or another. And sometimes those decisions are actually made by the potential cost of those projects. So um, when we talk about no estimates, I do think that doing that in a bubble, doing it without understanding the larger consequences can be really challenging to, a, to an organization, uh, to your potential customers or users. So it's important to understand that you have to um, sometimes justify why uh, why a particular project is a, is a good investment. Now, the issue is, uh, a lot of the time when, we, when we're doing this, we're doing it at a very granular level. And that granular level doesn't really make a lot of business sense, actually. Your product manager might want to know, you know every single task, whether it's going to take an hour or seven or you know, one gummy bear worth of effort or 20 gummy bears worth of effort. And, uh, and they want to know that because it makes them feel like they're in control um, because they're willing to ignore the fact that they know that you're lying to them. Um, and, and again, that's to make them happy, right? Everyone, everyone has to feel happy. So uh, the other thing that, that you'll get uh, along with that is anxiety. Um, you'll get this question, are we there yet? Um, I searched for Australian road trip. I'm assuming that this resonates for people. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> uh, so, you know, You'll get this question constantly, are we there yet? So then you get, you get pestered. And when you get pestered, then you, uh, you start waving the flag of micromanagement. Uh, and when you tell the manager that they're micromanaging, that's the quickest way to upset them. <laughs> and it might also be a way to get them off your back for a minute. But certainly, they're going to come back and keep asking you, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? So you, again, you have to try to. Um, assuage these, these concerns and these fears. So there's still a, um, a value in tracking something, right? But I'd like to try to hone in on uh, the very specific thing that we can track. So one thing, uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, if your pants are already on fire, then being a liar becomes less important. Um, so I asked you all, you know, how many of you do estimates? And some of you actually admitted to really enjoying like, lying. And that's fine. Um, but I actually have a shirt that says this, which I think is really hilarious, and I, and I wear it to planning meetings. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think you can, you can buy it anymore. But I recently got a new shirt, um, which I like better. So I, I want to wear this one here. <laughs> yeah, so, so this, is, uh, this is cool user story, bro. Also, I figured by this time in the talk, I'd be like nervous and a little hot, so I, I took off my hoodie. Um, so if we're going to do any measure, any level of estimating, we should do it for a reason. All right. we, should, we should actually have a reason to collect some piece of information to make it useful. Um, if, you, uh, if you are estimating now, and if you're estimating at tasks or story levels, um, and, you're tr and you're tracking all this info for your, uh, for your business or your organization. So I, I like a, a show of hands. I like, I like participation with hand showing. Um, how many of you have to do that? Okay, a few. Um, do you so independent of whether or not you have to do it? Do you feel that that is uh, unnecessary record keeping? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, and then uh, uh, do you actually believe that your organization uses that information, or does it just sit there and die? It just sits there and, and dies. Right. No one ever uses that information to do anything. Right. So that's that's one of the big realizations. Um, that, that I've had, and I think it's a realization of the, the, no, uh, the no estimate movement as well. So I'd like to describe uh, the level of estimation that I think is valuable. So 
First of all, uh, if you have something that is planned work, something that you know that you need to do, um, you, you've got it on a roadmap and you believe you need to do it, I think there's a value to doing t-shirt sizing. Um, how many of you are familiar with this concept of t-shirt sizing? So it's super, it's super uh, high level, it's not granular. Um, is this small, medium, or large compared to other work that we've done in the past? Do we believe that it is? Now, um, not at the story level, not at um, you know, making a login page return 200. You know, that's, that's not enough. But actually at, at the epic level, which is a, a scrummy term um, for basically an actual deliverable piece of work that might make a difference to your end user, um, is uh, you know, two uh, implementing two-factor authentication small, medium, or large? Maybe it's extra large. I think that whenever you get to extra large, it's actually time to sort of break it down or do some research work. Is the research to understand how to implement two-factor auth, small, medium, or large? And then we can make a decision later after we do some of that, some of that research. Um, so for planned work, I think it does make sense. I also want to encourage you to limit the number of t-shirt sizes you pick. <laughs> uh, I, I have worked at places that like to do t-shirt sizing for gross level planning and uh, and they have, you know, everything from double extra small to, you know, triple XL or whatever. And, and really, when, when you're doing that, you're just re-implementing, you know, Fibonacci sequence story points of insanity with, you know, a different thing other than gummy bears or, or koala bears or whatever kind of bears you like. Um, so why would I suggest to do story pointing, or sorry, to do t-shirt sizing? Um, your organization does need to have a long-term plan. Um, a, lot of, a lot of us work in organizations that have sales teams. How many of us have a sales team of some kind? Somebody that's responsible for bringing in the money. Um, uh, they, uh, they need to sell what your product does now, um, but also, just as, just as important, uh, in order to respond to your competition out in the, in the market, they need to respond to um, what will be in the future. They need to be able to sell a contract for a year that includes not only what exists today, but what we think we could agree exists in the future. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the downfalls of doing estimates at a granular level, is that it convinces people who are not practitioners actually building the software, it convinces them that your guesses are concrete uh, commitments because they deal in concrete commitments. Your salespeople deliver concrete commitments. And when they fail to deliver those concrete commitments, sometimes there are even financial penalties. It's breaking a contract sometimes. Um, so you need to be really careful about what you, about what you agree to and the level of specificity uh, and guarantee you, um, you suggest whether or not that's what you're trying to do. So I do think it's important to give some high-level t-shirt sizing. Primarily, it allows the organization to at least um, uh, plan the roadmap out and maybe reorder work. If something is a large, but they can sneak a small in before that large gets done, they might reorient it and say, you know what, we'll work on this small thing first. Um, there is a big, general big problem of, of engineering estimates converting into contractual commitments to customers that we're not gonna fix in this room. But I think one of the things that we can do is um, actually provide less information and a feeling of less certainty, um, which has the benefit of being more accurate. So most of our work, though, <laughs> is unplanned. It's uh, the crazy stuff that comes in that you never expected. It, it's um, you know, a bug that made it its way to production that's killing a, a customer, maybe not literally, hopefully not literally killing a customer, um, that's hurting a customer that needs to be addressed. Uh, it's um, a market opportunity. You know, some customers coming along, and if, they, if you, you just had two-factor auth, you know, with Reddit, then they would be super happy, right? I'm picking on Reddit a little bit on this talk. Um, so, yeah, everyone else does. <laughs> Even Reddit picks on Reddit. So, uh, so unplanned work, I, I actually recommend do not estimate that work. Just get to work. Um, Unplanned work are often uh, actually quick things that you need to do um, and just get done. And the amount of time you take deliberating on the amount of time it's going to take to actually build it could easily actually overtake 
uh, uh, the work itself. So, um, so there are two main types of work that we do, planned and unplanned. Um, unplanned work, don't bother estimating at all. No one can, can plan for that. No one can expect it because it's unplanned. Um, but for planned work, I think in order to orient the roadmap at a very high level, your business people need some relative idea at a very gross level about the effort involved. So this is similar to Kanban. And uh, uh, my emoji heart disappeared. So um, I think Kanban uh, plus no estimates equals emoji heart. That doesn't exist. Yeah. So uh, who, who knows what Kanban is? Yeah. Um, this is pretty familiar. So this comes out of, of operations, and it becomes, comes out of operations because of the, the DevOps culture. Uh, who knows what DevOps means? Me neither. <laughs> so <laughs> it comes out of, of this, uh, this culture of, um, uh, of lean, um, sequential work. Uh, and so the idea is to limit the amount of, of work in progress at any given time in order to have a clean process uh, to, uh, to bring a piece of work through your, uh, your work centers, the various uh, teams that need to touch it in order to get it out the door. Um, so Kanban is a really lightweight um, uh, process model that I think uh, is pretty great just to be able to get a visualization of work in progress, uh, what still needs to be done, and then and what actually got, got completed. Um, again, very simple. Uh, there are good tools to do this. Um, if you are a fan of Jira, uh, they have an Agile plugin that has a Kanban board. It's pretty neat. Um, I work for a company called Pivotal. Uh, one of the things that we do that's actually kind of a tiny thing is Pivotal Tracker, which is a, also a, a, an issue tracking system which has this concept as well. Uh, there are tons of them. Um, but this is, the, this is the idea, the thing to track. So cycle time is, is what I think we should track. Um, so let's dig into the development process in order to understand what cycle time is. Um, so what is the development process? Um, we have phases of work. Uh, phase one, you know, the early part is, is planning something out, trying to figure out what we're going to build, roughly how we're going to build it. Uh, and then we move on to failing. And, uh, and then failing more. Um, Thinking you're succeeding uh, while you're still failing is, uh, is usually coming next. Reddit, um, ignoring the problem. Um, blaming planning uh, for being wrong in complete specification, so we, couldn't, we didn't actually know what we needed to build because we didn't get complete information. When in reality, what that means is, of course, you didn't get complete information. You just learned new information, which, uh, which affected your reality. Um, there's appealing to authority, um, mostly just trying to say that, you know, I'm the expert, leave me alone, I, I can do this, don't worry about it. Uh, and then, of course, there's heroics. Um, this is my brother, that's not true. Um, that is not true. It's surprising, right, how much smaller I am than him? Um, so, uh, so then there's heroics, where um, you hunker down and you stay up for 72 hours, and you beat on your keyboard, and you produce as many bugs as possible that seem to, look like, to, seem, seem to solve the actual problem. Uh, and then you ship it in containers, of course. Yeah. And then you fix all the bugs. Uh, and you do this probably for just as much time as you spent actually building the thing. Um, and then you're done, and you've built this house of cards. Uh, so what is the cycle? The cycle is start to finish. Uh, here's what I really like about this idea, um, is that by defining done as actually shipping and, and having a thing working out in the world, um, it makes users' lives better. And that is, that is when your project, your feature is complete, is when it makes your users' lives better. Um, so that's the metric that matters to me. Now, just as a side note, the beautiful thing here is um, if you don't like record keeping, um, but you have to uh, track a, an issue through a project anyway, uh, your issue tracker already has this data. It knows when you moved a ticket into the in-progress state, and it knows when you moved it to done. Um, and with those two pieces of information and a library in your, in your favorite programming language, um, you can actually write you know, a tiny little script to track cycle time, and even average them together, and we'll talk about that in a sec. And, uh, and that's a really, uh, really lightweight system. It doesn't require you to, uh, to re-enter this information into any other tool. 
um, which is actually my biggest pet peeve. Never make me repeat anything. Like, do not build a business process that forces me to repeat myself. So I do think that issue trackers are good because, as we stated before, they help you see the state of the world, what still has to be done, what's in progress, and what's completed. Um, and by having, being able to have that, that heads-up display of information, uh, you already have enough to track cycle time. So you know, the time between starting work and shipping it is the cycle time. I think that's the only metric that matters. Um, so we can use that to measure developer effectiveness. Um, let's say you know, we've completed you know, eight stories in recent history. Um, why eight? Because eight of these fit on my slide. Um, so let's say that uh, you know, the cycle time is in days. So if we're tracking being able to get things done in days, how many people can, can ship something every day if they want to? You can ship to production every day. One. Like, is it built into your development process and your delivery pipeline to be able to ship at will? How, who, who can ship at will? Uh, just every day. How about every week? Two weeks? A month? Three months? Six months? Oh, wow. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, everyone needs to buy you drinks later. So, um, so one of the keys to this is actually being able to reduce the amount of time it takes to get it into production. Because uh, what's interesting is, and I'm just going to use your example, I think you put your hands up somewhere around the three-month mark. Uh, if you track cycle time, and if we define done as making users' lives better, giving them that cookie, it takes you at least three months to give a user a cookie. But let me ask you a question. How quickly do you ship uh, bug fixes for critical issues in production? Whenever you want? Next day. Yeah. So you already have a process for shipping every day. What if you just use that to ship small fixes every single day? Just a, that's, a, that's an aside. I think this is amazing, the duality. This is actually, I've worked in this environment too, so it's not just you. The duality of having what we call scheduled releases at set times, set intervals, you know, a week, two weeks, a month, but also being able to ship a fix at any time if it's deemed important enough because it makes a customer unhappy, or which, which what that really means is because a customer yelled at an executive, right? But you've built a very fine-tuned process for shipping at will that you only use for what you call hot fixes. At which point, why not just call everything a hot fix? And then use that as your only shipping method, another aside. Anyway, so cycle time. Let's say we, we've, these are the last eight stories that we've, we've, um, we've changed. And this would be a, a rolling window, right? Every time we complete, we ship a, a story, this window rolls down. And you could pick eight, you could pick 20. It depends on you know, whatever you choose. Um, so the rolling average is, let's say that's, that's 37 days of effort that we, that we got done in the last, within the last eight tickets. Um, so that's eight stories. So that means it takes about uh, four and a half days on average to get something out the door. That's a really simple number to come up with, super simple. And it gives you a very, a very high level average of the cycle time for your team. Um, so is four and a half days good? Fuck if I know. I mean, that's up to you. Uh, I know that uh, we talked earlier about t-shirt sizes, and getting your work into re uh, reasonably consistent sizes, even if you're just using intu intuition, is kind of important. So to give you an example, um, for any customer-facing bug fix on the team that I last led, uh, we had an average of a one-hour cycle time. So from the time we heard that the customer had the problem to the time it was fixed in production, on average, was an hour. Sometimes it was eight, occasionally. It was like a whole day. Um, but most of the time, it was actually several minutes, and that kind of balanced, balanced it out. Um, for ongoing work, uh, it took us usually about seven or eight business days to get something out the door. So that was fine. Um, so it, I think it's important to use the actual data or stop collecting it. It's actually kind of dangerous to, to over-collect data because someone is going to find that spreadsheet and try to use it uh, to make promises, right? So don't make that spreadsheet. So how do we improve? So what if 4.6 something days is not uh, an acceptable cycle time? Well, the important thing here is to stabilize the cycle time. A lot of people would, would maybe draw to the conclusion that we want to reduce the cycle time uh, 
over the course of the lifetime of, of a project, you, you don't want to like, reduce it. If you get to zero, then you're probably not even working. Like You're not doing anything. Um, but you want it to stabilize. So uh, if your cycle time is varying wildly every time you, you finish a project or two, um, then you probably uh, are not doing a good job even of that, of that t-shirt sizing. Um, and you're probably not breaking work down into reasonable pieces. So we can do this by refactoring. Um, this actually is creating a business case to stabilize your cycle time uh, to make it relatively consistent. It's creating a business case for refactoring because certainly you all have technical debt that you hate and you never have a good reason for fixing it up. Well, one reason is to be consistent about your ability to ship. Everyone wants that. You can automate. I think this is really critical. Continuous delivery is a must for being able to reduce your cycle time. Uh, continuous delivery is, a, is, is what I think the most important reason to automate your software delivery pipeline. Um, so this includes things like continuous integration and testing, uh, automated testing, all the way to hopefully being able to ship, ship at least at the click of a button, if not automatically. Um, so automating all of that is, is a really good way to cut down on the amount of time it, gets, it takes to give a customer a cookie. Eliminate wasteful process. I said, you know, don't make me repeat myself. Don't make me uh, enter you know, the same number in three different places. So just get rid of it. In fact, here's my pro tip. Eliminate all the process, absolutely all of it, and only add back what you absolutely need. And I think you would find that you actually need very little process to, to just consistently move the needle and get work done. Um, create autonomous teams. Uh, this is actually where uh, the organiza your organizational structure can influence your ability to deliver. Um, if your teams can deliver independently, if they're working on services or a collection of services that can be relatively independently managed, that means they might be able to be relatively independently delivered, which means that they're not dependent on every single engineer in the organization to be in a good state with their software in order to get a fix out the door for one small piece. And that, that's really where I would say apply Conway's law, not Damien Conway, who's an excellent Australian that everyone here might know. Um, but uh, I actually forget the, the original uh, gentleman's name. But Conway's law is, is what I just stated. The organizational and communicational structures will be represented in your technological structures. So your architecture and the way that your software uh, communicates in, in, inside of itself and the way it's organized is almost certainly uh, a manifestation of the way that your internal team is organized. So if you, are, if you have teams that don't, don't ever talk to each other, they're siloed, they hate each other, they think you know, their, their uh, ideas are, are horrible, and, uh, and they can't ever seem to communicate, chances are those teams are building tools that never integrate well, that have bugs at their integration points constantly, because you have organizational bugs in your, in your uh, integration points. So Conway's law has a lot to do with it. So these are bigger picture items than just you know, your code, but it's really critical. So doing what matters. Focus on cycle time. Eliminate your wasteful uh, processes that get in the way. Uh, that'll help you ship more software, ship more quickly, ship more consistently, and that'll make your users happy. Um, so I said that I wanted to leave some time for discussion. Um, when I was discussing this talk in the hallway with folks, almost everyone brought up to me that uh, they either want to be or are a consultant and uh, are not sure how to properly uh, make promises to their customers without either losing a lot of money or a lot of sleep. Um, I ran a consultancy for uh, four or five years, uh, pretty recently, so I've got some, some experience there, but um, this is a good, I actually finished up a little bit early on purpose so that I would give some time if anyone has questions or thoughts, so go for it. Should we get a microphone? Yeah, yeah. thank you. G'day. Um, I have been pondering that whole question uh, in the earlier part of the talk uh, that you answered with you are you know, software development uh, and I come from the support side. Support is an investment by the company because my problem has been um, you know, developers and support is seen as a cost center. It costs money and you know, we pour all this money in and nothing comes out. Mm -hmm. Seeing it as an investment is a, is a really great insight. Um, 
what I what I'm interested in is that idea of the reward. Give, you know, giving your giving your users something is personally satisfying to developers, and it's also you know from my perspective, when I can solve a problem for a customer, that makes me happy. What other what sort of other bounds of that personal fulfillment more than just the here here's the customer you know because we we also see the customer go away and you know we fix this you know bug that they were screaming about and then they disappear right. so how do we sort of close that feedback loop yeah so closing the feedback loop that's an interesting uh interesting question so um i'm glad that that you touched on this. Uh, one of the one of the things that I strongly believe is in uh, empathy for your users, and uh, one of the strongest expressions of empathy for a team building tools to try to make people's lives better is user experience. So everything from uh, customer support interactions to the ability to solve a pain point for a customer quickly is wrapped up in the experience that your users have with your software and with your company and with you personally. Um, so if you want to express your empathy, your care um, for the people who, whose lives you're trying to, to affect, um, being able to move quickly uh, and solve problems and really investing in the ability to move quickly as, a, as an organization is really critical. Um, so, uh, so when we talk about um, other ways of closing that feedback loop, I, I actually feel that uh, maybe the way that I'd like to address that is uh, as customers, or sorry, as developers, we're often cut off from the actual users that are using a product, especially in larger organizations. Um, you've got product managers and customer support people who, by the way, know more about your product than you do. The customer support people know everything about your product. No one else does. Uh, that's, if you ever want to know what your product does, ask a customer support person. Chances are you are incorrect about what you think your product does. Um, so. Uh, uh, one thing I would su strongly suggest is uh, programmers taking a tour of duty in customer support, actually getting on the phones. In fact, uh, hiring, put them on customer support for the first week or two. That will give them a strong appreciation for what your software does that's good and what it does that is poor. So um, that's one way to, to get that feedback loop in. But as engineers, if you, if you are struggling to receive real feedback from customers, go find them. Uh, so the way to do that uh, would be, again, to get on customer support, um, go out to lunch with the customer support folks and become friends so that you can create a back channel. I, I really hate hierarchical structures that get in the way. Um, you know, you might get that impression because I'm telling you to literally throw all your process away, which is going to make people terrified. But, um, but I've, uh, I've never been disappointed by going directly to a salesperson and saying, what do you need from engineering? Even though I'm not a manager and I'm not an influencer, I'm just, you know, you're a programmer, but frankly, I want to know. And so I would say go out and seek it out. Uh, be very proactive. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for one of the more interesting and useful talks that I've, I've been to. And I, I say that because I, I, I work for an organization um, heavily invested in Grails. So you're forgiven for taking Pivotal's focus away from, from that project. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, I'm also one of those annoying proponents of agile. Um, so, would, would you be offended if, if uh, would you be offended if I said that um, I believe that agile is a philosophy and that what you're proposing is just a number of processes and methods to be more agile? Right. Um, I wouldn't be offended at all, at all, and I think that's a really good thing uh, to bring up. It's actually why why I have the joke about what is agile. Nobody really knows, um, and it's the same joke when I ask what is DevOps. Nobody really knows. Um, the reality is that it's a, it's a mindset, it's a, it's a culture, it's um, an attitude about the processes that we choose to engage in, the way that we choose to collaborate and work with one another. So I'm not, or at least that's my, my feeling on it, so I'm not, I'm not offended at all that you would say that. Um, I believe it was Dave Thomas that wrote a really great piece a few years back where he said, um, Agile ha as a term has lost a lot of meaning, but um, but the manifestation of that and, the, uh, and, the, and the, the outcome that we've achieved from trying to focus on what it might mean to be agile is a concept of, a, of agility, which you know, is in Susie's uh, 
uh, poster right over there that uh, it's an increase in agility. So I, I think that uh, agility as a, as a concept matters a lot, and that's the manifestation that, that I like. But I do agree with you. I think a lot of the things outside of Waterfall that, that I mentioned are, are different ways to, be, uh, to practice this concept of agility or, or agile. Do you agree? Yeah? OK. Uh, anyone else? Questions, thoughts? No? That's fine. All right. Um, I'll just ask everyone to give me a hand in uh, thanking Casey for this, and I'll go grab the gift. Thank you. I think you have.